In previous episodes, we have examined reported incidents involving cryptids in possession of near supernatural abilities, as well as others focusing on allegations of ghostly and inexplicable poltergeist activity. But this week, we'll be looking at a mysterious series of events which incorporate both. Join us as we delve into the horrifying history of the Hexham Heads. Pushing open the low wooden gate which led into her front garden, the schoolgirl shouted a farewell to her two friends, who had continued on their way along Rose Road. Aware that her parents would both still be at work for another hour or two, she bent down to retrieve the front door key from its hiding place beneath the flower pot, and then let herself inside. As she did every evening as she returned home from school, Bernice Ross hung her school blazer and bag on her allocated peg, and then looked around for the family cat. The ginger Tom was less than a year old, highly inquisitive, and was always waiting for her in the hallway upon her return. And yet today, the room stood dark and silent, with no trace of the family pet. Calling out its name... Bernice paused for a moment before she heard a muffled cry coming from inside the front room. Joyfully, the girl strode across the hall and pushed the door open to find the small cat sitting staring back at her. Reaching out to pick it up, she was startled when it suddenly lashed out at her with its claws, hissing angrily. Staring down in disbelief at her pet, which had never acted this way before, she slowly backed away out into the hall. Bernice was halfway to the door when she heard a muffled thud from up on the landing. Aware she should be alone in the house, the 15-year-old called out for her parents, receiving nothing but silence in return. Peering up into the dark shadows which blotted out the top of the staircase, Bernice convinced herself that she must have been hearing things and had turned her attention back to the cat when she heard yet another soft thud emanate from above her. Almost immediately, the small animal gave a frightened mule before retreating further into the living room. Bernice began to edge towards the front door, her eyes fixed on the top of the staircase. Ever so slowly, a foot appeared from the shadow, carefully and deliberately planting itself on the uppermost step. It rested there for a moment, before another appeared, descending to the next step down. They were like no feet she had ever seen, covered in a thick pelt of fur with menacing claws extending out from long toes. They began to continue their journey down the stairs towards her, Step by step, a nightmarish apparition revealed itself, its whole body covered in the same dark hair. She could see now that its face was dominated by a long snout, with a wide mouth filled with sharp teeth. As the intruder fixed her with a searching stare, its mouth opened even further, a thick tongue lolling to one side. The girl let out an ear-piercing scream, as long and as loud as she could. Instantaneously, the terrifying creature recoiled, vaulting up and over the banister above it and disappearing from sight. Hours later, 
when Richard Feacham arrived home from work, he found his daughter shut in the living room. The door was barricaded, and she had her beloved cat cradled in her arms, still too terrified to go anywhere else in their home. The incident was the last straw for Richard, who immediately phoned the university where his wife was working. In blunt terms, he delivered his ultimatum. Either she removed the antiquities she was researching from inside their home, or he would take the children and leave. The bewildering story of the two mysterious items that would later become known as the Hexham Heads began in May of 1971, in the rear garden of Three Reed Avenue, an anonymous dwelling situated in the Northumbrian market town of Hexham. This was the home of the Robson family, and on the afternoon in question, the family's two sons were playing outside the house in the rear garden. Colin and Leslie Robson had been engaged in a game which consisted of digging small pebbles up out of the ground and then throwing them at one another. They had been occupied by this activity for a short while, much to the frustration of their mother, when both boys suddenly ceased what they were doing. When Mrs. Robson stepped outside to check on them, her two sons produced a pair of unnaturally smooth stones, both of which appeared to have crude human faces etched upon them. They were roughly six centimeters in diameter, but quite different in their apparent design. One was quite masculine in appearance, seeming to represent a young boy, whilst the other possessed distinctly female features. Suitably impressed with their find, the two boys brought the stones back into the house and set them to one side but over the course of the coming days, they would come to regret this decision. The first indication that something unnatural may have entered the house along with the two artefacts came when the adults of the family noticed that the stones seemed to be able to move of their own accord. Waking up of a morning, Mr. and Mrs. Robson would find that the heads had been turned around overnight facing the opposite direction to how they had been left the previous evening. Sometimes they were found lying on the floor, and on several occasions they were located in different rooms to the one they had been left in. Not long after this, there were several instances of glass objects inexplicably shattering inside the house, despite there having been no one near them at the time of their destruction. Although all the broken glass was collected and disposed of, Long shards were later found secreted under the pillows of the girls of the household, a transgression which both boys vehemently denied they had anything to do with. Then, after several weeks of this strange activity, Colin woke up crying in the middle of the night. When Mrs. Robson went to comfort him, he claimed that he'd felt his hair being yanked whilst he was sleeping by a pair of invisible hands. Colin's mother had been sitting on his bed, trying to soothe both him and his brother, who had been awoken by the commotion, when she had suddenly become aware of a presence in the doorway. Looking up, she was horrified to see a haunting vision staring back at her from the entrance to the room. It was humanoid in appearance, but was entirely covered in fur, with a face resembling that of a goat or sheep. The second this entity became aware that Mrs. Robson could see it, it immediately disappeared from sight, leaving no trace it had ever been there. Trying to write the incident off as being emotional and overtired, the rattled housewife elected not to mention the encounter to anyone else, but she was horrified shortly afterwards when her neighbours revealed a similar sighting. Number 1 Reed Avenue was located directly next door to the Robson family residence, and was home to Isaac and Nellie Dodd, who had four children of their own. Whilst having a drink one evening with her neighbour, Nellie asked if the Robsons had experienced anything unusual in the weeks before. When asked why, she recounted an unnerving situation which had played out several nights before. 
On the evening in question, young Marie Dodd had been suffering the effects of a severe ear infection, and so Nellie had gone into the youngster's room at bedtime in order to comfort her. Just as Marie was on the verge of dropping off to sleep, the girl had suddenly sat upright in her bed and began to scream uncontrollably. Unable to calm her daughter down, Nellie had pleaded with her to reveal what was wrong and was horrified when she slowly raised a finger and pointed to something behind her. The mother turned to see a terrifying creature standing at her shoulder, apparently reaching out for her with a long taloned hand. The intruder had the body of a man, but a face composed of several different animals, like a combination of features possessed by a wolf and a goat. Almost immediately, Nellie also started to scream, her frantic cries merging with those of her daughters. The two women watched in horror as the creature dropped down onto all fours, and then quickly fled the room. As Isaac Dodd came running across the landing towards the bedroom, he stopped in his tracks as he heard heavy footsteps proceeding down the staircase behind him. Running back to the top of the stairs, he heard the back door to the address opening. As he quickly made his way down into the hallway, he found the door now wide open. Isaac had locked the door himself an hour before, and was at a loss to explain how it had been opened. More bewildering still, there was no trace of anyone in the garden, despite the high fences surrounding it, and the side gate still secured with a deadbolt. In the days that followed the encounter, activity similar to that experienced in the Robson household began to manifest at number one. Several bottles were seen to roll off tables and smash onto the floor, despite being upright and unattended at the time. The children also made repeated claims that they had been slapped or had their hair tugged by an invisible hand. Eventually, the activity became so distressing that the Dodds considered moving away from the area, but as events were about to demonstrate, whatever had plagued them was far from tethered to the town of Hexham. After several weeks of apparent poltergeist attacks, the Robsons finally decided that enough was enough, and passed the heads on to staff at the local abbey. From there, the trinkets were sent to Southampton University for analysis, arriving on the desk of a lecturer named Anne Ross. Dr. Ross was an expert in the field of pagan antiquity, and formed the opinion that the two small stone carvings were likely Celtic in origin. During the course of her analysis, she eventually took them home, placing them in a box, but then subsequently forgot about them. A week later, Dr. Ross awoke unexpectedly one evening after feeling a presence in her bedroom. Straining her eyes and looking into the dark corners of the room as her husband slept beside her, she suddenly caught sight of a dark shape, standing concealed in the shadows. As the figure then hurried towards the door, she caught a brief glimpse of a tall and slender frame. It moved upright as a biped, covered in jet black fur, with a wolf-like snout protruding from its face. Jumping out of the bed in pursuit, the doctor saw it disappear down her stairs, but was too frightened to follow. Initially, she did not associate the event with the Hexham heads, but several days later, there was a further encounter. Her husband Richard was ill in bed, and their 15-year-old daughter had been taking him a meal upstairs when she had found her path blocked by a sinister entity. As Bernice had tried to scream, the intruder had vaulted the banister and disappeared from sight. The young girl had clearly heard the thump of its feet hitting the wooden flooring of the hall below, but when she ventured a look down, there was no trace of it. When nothing of a similar nature took place over the next week, the professor believed the matter concluded, 
only to receive an angry phone call from her husband while she was at work. He returned home to find that Bernice had locked herself in the living room and was too terrified to come out. When she had calmed down, she told him she had seen the creature as she had come home from school. Having now become aware of the history behind the items she was keeping, the doctor hastily removed them and had them placed into storage at the university. The heads would stay there for the next seven years, subjected to occasional testing, until they were then acquired by a man named Frank Hyde. He was an engineer with an interest in the paranormal, and asked to be allowed to run tests on them using a Faraday cage. When Hyde passed on in 1984, the location of the heads was lost with him, and whilst the result of his tests on the items have never been made public, some of those conducted at the university were indeed published. The studies carried out by the staff at Southampton University have only added further mystery to the origins of the Hexham heads. They were so roughly carved that it proved difficult to find techniques from any previous historical period to align them to. In addition, there was no organic matter held within the stones, making them virtually impossible to date. It was ascertained that they had been created from what appeared to be solid rock, rather than from any modern composite or type of cement, and that the rock used was grey sandstone, possessing a high degree of quartz. This was in keeping with the rock formations found in the area immediately surrounding Hexham. There was, however, no evidence that the Celts had ever settled the region, and the stones were unlike anything found in the culture of the Roman settlers who founded the town. In 1974, a local tradesman named Des Craigie came forward to claim that he had carved the stones for his daughter, having resided at Three Reed Avenue before the Robsons moved in. To prove the point, he produced a number of copies carved from a composite material, moulded from local crushed stone. But whilst these were similar in nature, Craigie's claims were dismissed by academics, who stated that the carvings and materials used were different. So, if the Hexham heads were not a prank or oddity produced by a local resident, then what were they? In the absence of any further evidence, it would seem that the parallels drawn by Dr. Ross may be the closest explanation. The Celts believed that the head was the location of the human soul, and that stone depictions of it may create links to the spirit world. Countless crude representations of stone heads have been unearthed around Britain, often situated near water, which was believed to act as a conduit for the undead. Hexham is also no stranger to stories involving wolf-like creatures, and in 1904, both the town and the neighbouring settlement of Allendale were plagued by a series of brutal cattle slayings. Veterinarians who examined the bodies claimed that the culprit was most likely a large wolf, and several such predators were hunted and killed during the following months. But the slayings continued for another year, until suddenly coming to an end for no apparent reason. When later interviewed in relation to the Hexham heads, Dr. Ross stated she had never heard the story of the Wolf of Allendale. Given the great distance between Southampton and Northumbria, and the relatively localised nature of the legend, this seems entirely feasible. In the years which have passed since the mid-1970s, the families involved in the story have maintained their accounts of the incidents, without deviation. What little interest there was from the press at the time has long faded, and perhaps the only way to resurrect the story would be to admit that it was a hoax, but both the Ross and Dodd children still stand by their claims. With the loss of the stones, we will likely never know the link between their creation and the bizarre humanoid entities which were seemingly attached to them. All we can do is wait and see if any similar antiquities come to light in the future, 
and if they do so, what else surfaces alongside them? Annapurna, the tenth highest mountain in the world, but the deadliest to climb. Try going up there in your checkered salad chef's slip-ons. Bad times.